Thanks for joining us tonight for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. God sent His Son They called Him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He lived and died To buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my savior lives because he lives i can face tomorrow Hi, thanks for joining us tonight for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. We've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit. We've looked at love, joy, peace, and now let's hurry up and learn about patience. <laughs> thanks for joining us tonight as we look at this most important but yet most difficult fruit of the Spirit to allow the, the God who loves us so much to bear out in our personal lives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the kindness that you've demonstrated to us. How patient you have been with us, Lord. And we pray, Lord, tonight as we look into the Word of God, we will discover how we can be someone who allows the Spirit to produce within us a life of patience that reflects the image and the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it is in His name we pray these things. Amen. Patience. You know, they say patience is a virtue. Well, that's what each of these are. They're virtues. They're fruit that are born in our spirit and in our hearts and lives by the very Holy Spirit of God, which lives within us. And because of that, we need to understand uh, in this particular lesson the enemy of patience. Because you see, I think that one of the reasons that we struggle with patience is we don't realize that patience, among many other of these virtues that we're looking at, has a distinct enemy. And we're going to take a particular look at that tonight. So first of all, let's try to understand patience. We want to see it from a biblical perspective, obviously, but let's look at understanding patience. First of all, the essence of patience. When we talk about the essence, we're talking about the rudimentary elements that actually demonstrate what patience is. And so we're going to look at the essence of patience. In James chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, we read these words. Be patient. It's not a, it's not a uh, suggestion. It's a, it's a direct statement. Be patient then, my friends, until the Lord comes. You know, one of the things that... Uh, we look at when we all say, you know, well, we wish Jesus would come. We wish he would come back right now. Uh, but one of the elements in which Christ demonstrated to us that we would not understand or know the exact day or the hour when Christ would come is it teaches us that element of patience. And here, James reiterates that. Even early on in the very first church, James, the very first pastor, he says, be patient then, my friends, until the Lord comes. 
See how patient farmers are as they wait for their land to produce their precious crops? They wait patiently for autumn and spring rains. You also must be patient. Keep your hopes high. You see, that's one of the keys to having patience, is keep your hopes high. For the day of the Lord's coming is near. It's always close. Do not complain against one another, my friends, so that God will not judge you. The judge is near and ready to appear. You know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is our final judge. Uh, But for you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are sons of God. We are the ones who are the object of His great love. And so we have no need to fear this judge. He is a judge who will bless us when we finally enter into His presence. You know, when we look at the essence of patience and we look at it in light of this particular passage of Scripture, we see some things. First of all, patience recognizes who's in control. You know, one of the reasons that we can be patient is we can say, you know what, God, you've got this. There have been times where I've gotten frustrated driving the car, either I had a flat tire or someone cut me off or I got stuck in a traffic jam and I wasn't able to get where I was supposed to go. And when I recognize who is in control, that God is control of the circumstances of my life, I have realized that many times maybe I was protected. You know, I've actually gotten caught up and and had a flat tire and had to get out and fix it and then went on down the road a little bit and there was a horrible accident that I realized had I not had that flat tire, I would have probably been involved in that accident. And what a terrible thing that would have been. But yet we look at our lives and we need to understand who is in control. Now, God doesn't use us like puppets and he doesn't... uh, control every little thing in our lives, but he is consciously aware of it. He knows the circumstances that we face, and patience teaches us how to recognize who is in control in any given circumstance or situation. God is always near. He is always close to us. When we look at that passage and it says, you know, the Lord is near, We need to understand that's not just near in His coming, but He's near with us at all times. So patience recognizes who is in control. Number two, patience focuses on hope. You see, we've got to have hope. We've got to keep our hopes high, the Scripture said. And so patience focuses on hope, not on the situation or the circumstance or the thing that causes us to lose our patience. And the third thing, and the most important one is this, and we're going to take an in-depth look at it tonight, is that patience knows it has an enemy. And that enemy is anger. And so we're going to take a look at that. Let's look in the Scriptures, if we would, at some examples of patience. When we look into James again, continuing in this passage, verses 10 through 11 now, he says, My friends, remember the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Take them as examples of patient endurance under suffering. They went through terrible circumstances. Well, we call them happy. Now, that word happy is more often translated blessed. We call them blessed because they endured. You have heard of Job's patience, and you know how the Lord provided for him in the end. For the Lord is full of mercy and compassion. And so we look at these two examples that are given to us, the prophets of the Old Testament and Job. Job is an epitome of patience when we look and trying to understand it. And I would encourage you to read much of the book of Job as you look at trying to understand patience in our lives. But let's look just quickly, just a few verses. First of all, the example of the prophets. Now, Jesus is teaching in this particular passage of Scripture at what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It begins in Matthew chapter 5, and the very first elements of this Sermon on the Mount are what we call the Beatitudes. In other words, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. By the way, that word blessed also means to be filled with great happiness, and that's the reason sometimes it is often translated happiness. But here we see happy or blessed are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. 
They, they kept to their guns. They stayed faithful to the message and the ministry that God had given them. It says the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy or blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you are my followers. Jesus said that. Blessed, happy you should be when people are saying terrible things about you because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, some people face that, some don't. I've known people that in their families, they had family members that they loved and were part of their lives, but they treated them horribly because they were believers and their family member was not, and they've been treated so horribly. I know personal from personal experience, I've been treated that way because of stands I have taken on the Word of God, stands I have taken for Jesus Christ. I have faced it many, many, many times, but the Scripture says Instead of being discouraged or despondent or depressed or frustrated or angry, the scripture says we need to be blessed. We need to be happy. Why? Because great reward is kept for you in heaven. You see that? Be happy and glad when those things happen. For a great reward is kept for you in heaven. And then it adds this element. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. You see, they were treated the same way, no different than many are today because they call themselves believers. And so we have the example of the prophets. Let's follow in their footsteps, he says. Then James also mentioned Job, the example of Job. Let's look at what he went through. He lost his family, he lost his, his livelihood, he lost all of his wealth. And his wife, who had lost all of her children, you need to be fair to Job's wife. A woman's life is often tied up in her children and the care of the home, and she lost everything. But she came to him, and she was very frustrated. She said, Are you still holding on to your precious integrity, are you? Curse God. Be done with it. He told her, You're talking like an empty-headed fool. We take the good days from God, why not also the bad days? Good advice, right? Not every day is a special, wonderful, happy, joyous day. We go through difficult times. So not every day is a good day. But do we not take them both from God? Is He not with us in the good day just as He is with us in the bad days? And it says this of Job. Not once through all of this did Job sin. He said nothing against God. You see, an example of patience is significant. And so you say, well, how do we demonstrate patience? What is the evidence of patience in our lives? Well, the evidence of patience in our lives is how we speak. It's our words. In the scripture, it tells us in James chapter 5 and verse 12, on the, on the heels of this, be patient, on the heels of Remember the prophets. Remember Job. He says this, And since you know that he cares, let your language show it. Since you know that Jesus cares about you, you know that he wants you to be happy. You know that he is full of mercy and compassion. You know that he is the one who will help you keep your hopes high and develop that attitude of patience in you. Since you know that he cares let your language show it. Don't add words like, I swear to God, to your own words. Don't show your impatience by concocting oaths to hurry up God. Just say yes or no. Just say what is true. That way, your language can't be used against you. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, had very similar words to say. In chapter 5, verses 33 to 34, and then verse 37, he says, and don't let anything you, don't say anything, excuse me, that you don't mean. In other words, be careful what you say. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smokescreen of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you and never doing it, or saying, God be with you and never meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. 
in making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. And then verse 37 says, just say yes and no. Didn't we just read that in James? Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. So the evidence of patience is reflected in our speech. <clears throat> and I have to admit, there are times when I lose my patience, and you would too. But in reflecting and looking back on it, often I am embarrassed by those times that I did not control uh, my frustration, my anger. And so what I want to do is I want to take us on just a little journey in learning to manage the enemy of patience, anger. <clears throat> so when we look at anger, we want to realize something. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 16 and verse 32, patience is better than strength, and controlling your temper is better than capturing a city. In other words, it is extremely powerful when we can control our temper, when we can control our anger. And patience is better than strength. Just mere strength that we have, patience is better, the Scripture says. So with that in mind, let's look a little bit at how you and I can manage the enemy of patience in our lives, anger. And you know what? In these days, it is completely understandable that people get frustrated, people get upset, people get angry. In my, uh, in my devotion for tomorrow morning, and I hope that you follow me each day, in my devotion for tomorrow morning, we're talking about this essence of our words and, and how we say things. And when we look into the Word of God, we understand that we have a tendency toward anger. Now, Jesus got angry, but he never sinned as a result of it. His anger was a righteous anger, and he had every right to be angry in the times in which he was angry. But he never took it out on people. He never lashed out them or was punitive toward them. He just called it the way it was. And he always did that with the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the hypocrites, he called them a brood of vipers. He let them know where they were. And he said the problem with them and the reason he was harsh with them is because, number one, they did not know God, and number two, they did not know his word. And so uh, anger can be righteous, but you and I, you and I need to understand that Jesus demonstrated mercy and grace and patience in 99% of all of his conversations with people. So patience is better than strength, the scripture says. So let's begin by looking at managing the enemy of patience, anger. Number one, if you're going to get angry, realize the cost. Many a relationship has been destroyed because they got angry. I have seen people get angry and just ruin relationships, ruin good things in their lives because they got angry. And you know what? Anger is catching. Sometimes they will join together and we'll get three or four people and more that will be angry at the same time and angry at the same person. And by the way, anger is nearly always directed toward an individual or a group of individuals. And so when you get angry, you need to learn something from the Word of God. There is a cost involved when we just live out our anger. Let's look. Proverbs 29, verse 22. An angry person causes what? Trouble. Trouble. A person with a quick temper sins a lot. And you know, when we look in the scripture, it doesn't just say they sin, they sin a lot. And so we need to understand there's a cost. There will be trouble associated with the anger and there will be a great deal of sin that will be involved in the process when you just let it run rampant. Here, Proverbs 14, verse 17. The hot-headed do things they'll later regret. And all God's people said, Amen. Hot-headed people do things they later regret. Uh, a lot of counseling that 
uh, goes on in among Christian counselors is dealing with hot-headed things that are said and done that they now regret. But sometimes the damage that they do is so costly that relationships cannot be mended the way you would hope they would be. Proverbs 14, 29. If you stay calm, you are wise. But if you have a hot temper, you only show how stupid you are. Profound words from the Word of God. And then finally, Proverbs 11 and verse 29. The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left. Dear friend, if you are uh, someone who is constantly angry, constantly lashing out in anger, uh, I have known men that were angry and lashed out at their wife and their children. I have known women who were angry and lashed out at their husbands and their children. And when you look at it in the end, they have absolutely nothing worthwhile left. Anger destroys relationships and destroys families. Anger can cost you your job. Anger can cost you friendships. So when we look at it, we need to realize there is a cost associated with anger. All right, number two. You and I need to learn if we're going to get to be a get to the point where we can manage the enemy of enemy enemy of patience. I'll get it out eventually. We need to reflect before reacting. I know when I was a boy, I would get angry sometimes, and my dad say, "Count to ten first. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. We're reflecting before reacting. We're we're looking at it. And we need to stop just a minute. Be patient. That's what we're doing. Be patient. Count to ten. In some people's cases, they need to count to a thousand. Amen? The scripture says in Proverbs 29 and verse 11, A rebel shouts in anger. A wise man holds his temper in and cools it. Now, this is an important observation. Everybody gets angry. But someone who doesn't control their anger, they just shout it out. A wise man still gets angry the same way everyone else does, but he holds his temper in and cools it down. He takes it and allows it to cool down a little bit, to reflect before reacting. Proverbs 19, verse 11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is his glory to overlook an offense. Our tendency is when we're offended, we want to lash out. But here the scripture tells us a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is his glory to overlook an offense. Somebody says something offhanded, somebody says something unkind, untrue, whatever it may be. It is your glory when you overlook such an offense. And I think that's an important passage to look at. Let's ask ourselves three questions okay when we want to reflect before reacting there are three questions that we need to ask number one why am i angry uh, there could be any number of reasons maybe i'm hurt does hurt really mean that we need to be angry no not necessarily we're frustrated sometimes we're frustrated but does that mean i need to be angry in my frustration sometimes we're just afraid I've known a lot of people that displayed anger because they were afraid, afraid of losing something, afraid of this or afraid. Of, they got angry because they were afraid. But yet the scripture tells us to fear not. 365 times in the Bible, I don't believe that's any coincidence, it tells us fear not, fear not. And so I have to ask myself the question first and foremost, why am I angry? So if you're going to reflect before you react, ask yourself the question, why am I angry? There's a second question you need to ask. What do I want? What do I want? And then when you ask yourself the question, what do I want? You have to look at yourself and say, is what I want realistic? Is that really something that I can expect? But ask yourself that question. What do you want? And then how can I get it? 
Can I get it through my anger? Can I get it through lashing out? Can I get it through just my raw strength? Or is there something else that I need to exercise and use in order to get what I want? You've got to ask yourself those questions when you stop and reflect before you react. So first of all, realize there is a cost to your outlashing of anger, your words, your actions. Number two, reflect before you start reacting. Ask yourself, why am I angry? What do I want? And how can I realistically get that? And you need to say that without hurting others. Then number three, you need to release anger appropriately. Some people just can't handle releasing their anger appropriately. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. It says, if you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. A lot of people really nurse their anger. Scripture says, don't let the sun go down with you still angry. Get over it quickly. For when you are angry, you give a mighty foothold to the devil. You see, anger is the, the beginning stages of what we call bitterness. When we become angry, we begin to reflect on it. We begin to nurse the grudge. And before you know it, you have developed an attitude or a spirit of bitterness. And bitterness is where Satan can get into your life and begin to cause difficulties and ruin. The scripture says he's like a roaring lion seeking to devour whom he may. And when you and I constantly nurse that anger, we go to bed with it, we get up with it, we go to bed with it, we get up with it, we give a mighty foothold to the devil. It's like he's got a foot in so that he can begin to use our bitterness to destroy our reputation, our lives, and our ministry. And so you and I need to be careful about anger. We need to release that anger in an appropriate way. How do we respond to anger? First of all, don't repress it. When I say repress, you know, uh, repressing your anger is anger without any constructive action. In other words, I'm angry, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, you're also nursing it at that point. You're, you're repressing it. You, you, I guess the good word to use is I swallow my anger. And dear friends, if you swallow your anger and you repress it, you will become bitter and you will burn from the inside out. It's very important not to repress your anger. You say, but I thought we're supposed to put it aside and not, not do it. No, that's a negative way of dealing with your anger. Do not just repress it. At that point, you're just ignoring it. Okay? Which is the next one. Don't suppress it. So you've pushed it out of the way. You think you can ignore it and you think you can deny it. But dear friend, um, you're just not dealing with it is the thing. You have to deal with your anger. You have to deal with your anger. Don't suppress it. Don't ignore it. And don't deny that it's there. You saw that passage before. You know, <clears throat> a rebel shouts in anger, but a wise man holds his temper and cools it. How does he cool it? You know, we don't always understand all the implications, but he deals with that anger in an appropriate way. He doesn't let the anger control him. But suppressing it, just pretending that you're not angry, will not work. It will not work. Third thing, don't just express it and blurt it out. That'll lead you to a lot of problems as well. Um, you blow up. Here are two other ways. Let me share with you this. Two other ways that we express our anger in negative terms. Number one, we not just only, you know, we don't blow up, we, but we, we become sarcastic. Have you noted that among people? Whenever something comes up that's a hotbed and they're angry about it, they get sarcastic about it. And here's the big one. Sometimes people express their anger by pouting. They just pout about it all the time. Well, don't do that. Don't blow up. Don't get sarcastic. Don't pout. You say, well, what do I do? You confess it. 
But there's a progression. There's a way to confess it. Number one, you need to admit it to God. God, I'm angry. God, uh, this really upsets me. When you begin to talk to God about the issue, you talk to God about the problem, you're well on your way to a healing. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to admit it to yourself. You've got to confess it to you. You can say, I am angry about this, but I don't like feeling like this. I don't like being like this. You've got to confess it to yourself. You've already confessed it to God, and He already knew, but sometimes we need to confess it to ourselves. We need to seek God's guidance and love and forgiveness in circumstances and situations. But then sometimes it doesn't go away. Sometimes we need to confess it or admit it to the person who has hurt us, the person who has frustrated us or caused us fear that led to our anger. Sometimes we need to let them know. Now, bear in mind, you don't blurt it out and yell and scream and holler at them. But you do it in a controlled way. You you admit to them. You say, listen, I've talked to God about this. And, and I know that I don't want to feel this way. But what you said or what you did really hurt me and made me angry. And I just wanted you to know that. And then it's important, especially if they say, well, I didn't mean to do that. I, You know, I'm sorry. You need to express forgiveness and say, then I forgive you. Now, the word forgive means I'm releasing from debt. I'm, I'm not going to hold this over you anymore. Some people say, well, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Well, you sometimes you can't forget. God can forget. But you and I, we say we can't forget. But the way to stop remembering is not to dwell on it, not to constantly Bear it in mind, nursing that grudge over and over and over. You've got to stop talking about it. You've got to stop thinking about it. And what you need to do is just openly confess it to God, admit it to yourself, and admit it to the person who has hurt you. Sometimes you don't have to do that, but there are certain times where you have to do that, especially in a marriage relationship because you live with that person day in and day out. And if you're struggling with this grudge, you're struggling with this hurt and this anger, you've got to sit down and talk. Okay? So don't repress it. Don't suppress it. Don't express it. Do confess it. All right? Here's number four. You need to relate to people who are patient. There are some people in our lives that they demonstrate patience. They have the patience of Job. They they. Uh, look at them and you see how they deal with circumstances, situations. Relate to people who are patient. Sometimes when you're struggling with patience and you're frustrated and angry and you're hurt, go to that person. Sit down with them because they have conquered that spirit of anger for the most part. And we want to relate to people who are patient. Here, Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Don't hang out with angry people. Don't keep company with any hotheads. Bad temper is contagious. Don't get infected. <laughs> In this day of a, of a virus, you need to understand there's something else that's contagious. It's anger. Don't hang out with people who are constantly hotheads and angry. You know, I have known people in my life and they just devoted their whole existence to being angry and being a hothead. And you know what? I've had to walk away from those friendships, walk away from those relationships. Why? Because all they do is drag me down. It's contagious. You can get angry too and you don't want to do that. Husbands and wives, very important not to lead your spouse into your anger, okay? Because anger is non-productive. So you and I, we need to understand, watch it, relate to people who are patient, not to those who are not. And then look at this, do not be misled, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good character. And all God's people said, amen. Here's the last thing we've said, 
Realize the cost of anger. Reflect before you react in anger. Release your anger in an appropriate way. Relate to people who are patient because they are the ones who are going to be better for you to hang around and to be with, especially in such an angry environment. And then number five, rely on Christ's help. Jesus promises that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's always there to help us. Rely on his help in circumstances that lead to frustration, hurt, pain, fear, anger. The Bible says in Romans 15 and verse 5, May God who gives what? Patience. The God of all patience. May God who gives patience, steadiness, and encouragement help you to live in complete harmony with each other, each with the attitude of Christ toward the other. Let me ask you a question. Are you treating people the way Jesus treats them? You and I need to take a good long look at that. And when we begin to treat people the way Jesus treats people, we're well on our way to a life of patience. Let Him deal with the root cause of whatever it is that is frustrating and bringing you anger. Let Him hold you secure in His love and His future that He has for you. And gain His perspective and His attitude toward everyone. And when you and I begin to do that, we begin to reflect the love, the joy, the peace, and the patience of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much that you love us and that you are patient with us. In times, Lord, where we are challenged in our patience, may you take us under your loving wing. May you care for us and help us to be able to be that patient person that you want us to be. We know we can't do it in and of ourselves because our flesh is weak. But Lord, we know that your spirit is strong within us. And so we pray for your fruit to be born in our hearts and lives as we open ourselves to be used by you. Help us to display these fruit of the Spirit in our lives, the love, the joy, the peace, and now, Lord, the patience. Help us to be what you want us to be, that we would reflect the love, the character, and the perspective of Jesus Christ. Dear one, if you've been watching tonight and you say, Pastor, I don't know for certain if I died that I'd go to heaven, but I want to know. Would you like to receive Jesus? The scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God the Father raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Is that what you want? You want to be forgiven? You want to have a home in heaven one day? If that's you, would you just pray this prayer with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of all my sin, past, present, and future. I want to know that when I die, I have a home in heaven. So I place my faith in you, Jesus, believing that you died on the cross for me and shed your precious blood to forgive me of all my sin and to wash me white as snow. And I believe when they took you down from that cross and laid you in a borrowed tomb, three days later, you gloriously, majestically, powerfully rose from the dead. And if you can do that, you can certainly give me a home in heaven one day with you. And so, Lord Jesus, will you come into my heart and my life? Will you be my Savior to forgive me? Will you be my Lord? to lead me, help me to make the right decisions in life, and will you be my friend to walk with me every day, good and bad, and one day walk the streets of heaven with you. Will you come into my heart and life? And dear one, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, you just received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let me encourage you to let someone know a friend, a neighbor, a family member, a co-worker, someone you know who's a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Tell them, today I receive Jesus. 
And if you don't know anyone you can tell, my email address is right there on the screen, Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com, and I would love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us tonight and being patient with me. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch you no matter where you go. And as we leave this time together, until we come back, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, keep looking up. Mm -hmm.